Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I share my recent conversation on the 99 Challenges podcast about how to become a better leader. Welcome to the 99 Challenges Podcast. On each episode in this show, we bring you one challenge that your business can face and invite experts to provide insights on overcoming these challenges. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Peter Benet, founder of Anywhere Consulting. In today's episode, we will talk about leadership. More importantly, how anyone can transition from an expert to a leader. To discuss how we can learn leadership skills, I invited John Westover, who's a professor in HR and partner and principal at Human Capital Innovations. Hello, John. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Lovely. So the first question is always to get some intro on what are you doing. I understand that you are working with and for Human Capital Innovations. What are you doing with Human Capital Innovations? And what is the main service that you're offering? And what's your story so far? Yeah, thank you. And again, thank you for having me on as a guest today. It was fun to have you as a guest on my (laughs) podcast uh, recently, I think just a couple of weeks ago. So you're returning the favor. Human Capital Innovations is a consultancy firm that I started back in 2007. And I was at the time I was finishing up my PhD and I, I love doing research. I love the academic pursuit and I love teaching, but I also wanted to continue doing practical uh, work to help leaders and organizations. And I'd done that in the past uh, with my work experience, both as an internal and an external consultant working with companies. And so I decided I'm, I'm going to start my own firm. Uh, I had a partner, a founding partner at the time. And since then uh, we've grown to bring other people on the team. And you know, I finished my PhD. I became a professor. I have a full-time job at the university, but I've always done the consulting work with human capital innovations on the side. And really uh, a little over a year ago, leading into the pandemic, I decided I wanted to, I'd hit a certain stage in my academic career where I'd you know, mm-hmm. progressed and reached the level of full professor. I decided I wanted to commit more time and energy towards the consulting work. Uh, and then the pandemic happened and it actually coincided quite nicely because I wasn't traveling as much. I was able to focus some more time on some of the particulars of the business. Anyway, so that's, uh, we can get more into that, but human capital innovations, as the name uh, suggests, it's all about maximizing the human capital potential within an organization. So leaders individually, we need as leaders to be able to maximize our own potential, but a huge part of leadership, probably the most important part of leadership is helping other people, the people in our teams, the people within our organizations to maximize their own potential. It's when they maximize their potential that they're going to be able to help the team and the organization be successful. That's the kind of environment that breeds a positive workplace culture, high levels of employee engagement, innovation, and creativity. And ultimately, that's what we need to bring value to the market on a continual basis in a hyper-competitive global marketplace. So that's what we do. We, we help organizations with training solutions, assessment solutions to figure out where their organization's at, where are they at as a leader. We also do coaching and change management consulting as well. The whole goal is to try to help organizations be their best possible selves if we're thinking of an organization as a person, but then each individual within an organization, including all leadership, to be their best possible self, to make it a rich, fulfilling environment for everyone involved. That's really great. Thank you for sharing this awesome story. 
If you're working closely with leaders, I, I suppose, what do you think, what, what are the main or crucial or key challenges that they approach you with? Yeah, I, th I think most people who find themselves in leadership roles, and when I say, uh, maybe I should step back for a second and, and clarify. Sure. So I think, I think all of us are leaders. All of us have the potential to influence those around us. All of us mm -hmm. uh, have the, the opportunity to be change makers within organizations, within our communities. So everyone can and should see themselves as a leader. But mm -hmm. if we look specifically at the formal leadership roles within an organization, so you have, you know, the CEO, C-suite all the way down, you know, anyone who supervises or manages people, you know, those, they're formal leaders with a formal leadership role. And most people who find themselves in those formal roles typically don't have a lot of training in how to be a good leader. They, they usually find themselves in that role due to their technical expertise. Perhaps, you know, they were really great at sales and now all of a sudden they're leading a team of salespeople. Now being great at sales isn't the same thing as being a great leader of salespeople. That's a different skill set. And so what we see in organizations all over the world is that you have people elevated to a, a role that they don't have any particular training in or understanding about. And so what do they do? The default becomes... What did I see other people do in my past? So if they happen to have come up in an organization where they've had good leaders who have managed really well and who have been empowering and engaging and motivating and such with a healthy culture and a healthy environment, then they will tend to model after that and continue that along. But the opposite is also true. And unfortunately, the more common reality is that you have people who don't really know how to lead effectively, they're, they're perpetuating dynamics and cultures and approaches that aren't healthy, that aren't helpful, and actually can hurt the team and the bottom line of the company. And it's not because they're doing it on purpose. It's not like they're setting out saying, I'm going to try to stick it to, to my people, but they just, they don't know any different. And so they're just doing what they've seen in the past. So the, the biggest thing I think we do when we work with leaders is to try to help them first acknowledge where they're at and where some of the gaps might be, set some goals on where they can develop, and then help provide the tools for them to develop those skills over time. Because leadership skills and capabilities are learnable. I, I fully believe in a growth mindset, and I believe everyone has the capacity to lead and influence and be a positive change maker with others in their lives. And it's just a matter of being able to step back and recognize that, yeah, we don't know what we're doing. We need some help, bring people in to help you. Awesome. We, we will get back to that learning curve, by the way, because that's really interesting. But before, before we do that, what I personally saw a lot is that there was a huge gap between managing people and as you said, and it's a great keyword, influencing or leading people. And, uh, and there's a huge difference between the two. Not all influencers or leaders are great managers, and most of the great managers are not really great leaders. So how do you see that? Yeah, there's definitely a difference between management and leadership. Management involves processes, procedures, yeah. those sorts of transactional types of issues within an organization. And those are important. You need someone to be an effective manager so they can stay on top of schedules and processes, the operations side of the organization and the people involved with carrying out the various tasks and responsibilities. Leadership though is something quite different. And you can be a very good manager handling all the logistics and be a really crummy leader. And in fact, that's often the case. You have many people yeah. that are quite good managers, but they, they're not good with people. They're not good with relationships. They're not good with communication. They're not good with motivation and empowerment. And those are all the elements that go into good, successful leadership. Now, ideally, you'll have someone with both skill sets, right? So someone who's elevated to a formal leadership role within an organization, hopefully they're good managers and chances are they are, otherwise they probably wouldn't have been promoted or hired into that position. The, the big question mark more often than whether or not they're a good manager, it's whether or not they actually have those soft skills around effective communication and such. And are they willing 
to commit the time and the effort into good leadership. That's that's one of the biggest gaps I see is you have mm-hmm. well you have well-meaning individuals who get bogged down into the day-to-day grind of their formal leadership role and because of all the logistical stuff, all the process stuff, all of the transactional things that need to happen, they end up spending all of their time or most of their time every day doing those things, putting out fires, responding to, yeah. sometimes it's micromanaging, but a lot of times it's, it's also just, it's just being reactionary to the environment and the circumstances around them. And they don't spend enough time building the foundation for trust and, and sustainable relationships and sustainable team dynamics, the strategic focus of what a leader needs to be doing in those sorts of formal roles. So yeah. again, even if, if even if their intention is a really good intention, I think people tend to fall into the trap of the day-to-day grind of just managing people. And then if they have a lot of expectations and pressure on them from above, then they're inclined to pass those that on to the people below them. And then micromanaging happens and it just becomes dysfunctional. So we need to recognize that while it's certainly, it may seem like it's easier to be reactionary as a leader, like that takes less time, less effort, less work. It's not true, uh, especially if you take the long view. So with a a longer term uh, time horizon, a long-term perspective, Mm -hmm. if we can focus our energies up front towards those systemic elements that build the trust, that build the relationships, that help people, that create the culture and the healthy environment, that all takes energy, that all takes commitment over an extended period of time. But if we can focus on that, then the other stuff starts to take care of itself more. And you don't have to do as much handholding. You don't have to do as much directing and guiding even. You can really take a leadership role where you're leaning on and relying on the expertise of the people in your team and and then just supporting them and helping them yeah. to to drive success and, and creating the clear vision for them to move forward that's what leaders should be spending more of their time doing and the, the business realities of a hectic world uh, i would say most don't end up using most of their time that way yeah most of them most of them are, are reactive but they have to be reactive and, and they didn't have the chance or the time or efforts to figure out beforehand how to create a, a great system of process. And I think, yes, I, as you said, most people are really great managers because they b- built up a company. They built up a, a company with a, co- a set of co-founders, for example, or, or senior managers around them. But when they actually need to hire someone to do their own job, right? That's the first hire that you always do. They are not really great leaders, but they had to become a really great manager because you know that makes them to, to that place that they are already in. But, but they have to learn and should learn some soft skills. And let's talk about that learning curve. Can I, um, be, before we get into to that, course. a principle that maybe you and all of your listeners already know about, it's a, it's a common management principle called the Peter Principle. If you're familiar with that, it's the simple idea that most people end up getting promoted to their level of incompetence within organizations, right? And so you can think of humorous examples in TV and in movies. I think of in the US, we have a TV show called The Office with a leader. I, I don't know if you know, if you and your audience know that show. But M- Michael Scott, who's the, the office manager, he's the poster boy for incompetence as a manager and a leader, right? And how did he find himself into that find himself in that role? He was he was the best salesperson. And because he was great at sales, he ends up getting promoted. Now he's a manager. It's a completely different skill set. He doesn't know what the crap he's doing. And that's the classic example of the Peter principle. People getting hired and promoted to their level of incompetence. If they were good at that new role, they would probably get promoted again. But eventually we get, we get promoted to the level that we're not any good at. So the challenge, I think, for organizations is to recognize the competencies and capabilities of our team and create lanes and pathways for people to have career development and promotional opportunities, but to not force people into roles where they're not going to be any good. So the Michael Scott example, you know, what, he didn't need to be a, a, an office manager. He could have kept being a salesperson, made a lot of good, good money, been very successful, very happy, 
right? But instead, he ends up finding himself in a role that he's not any good at. And, and then we end up perpetuating that across the organization with lots of people in lots of roles that they're not any good at. So let's focus on competencies and capabilities. And as we're talking about leadership, that's, again, a different set of competencies, skills, and capabilities than you know, being a great coder or a good salesperson yeah. or whatever, right? Well, well, it works totally differently if you're a small or medium-sized business or an enterprise-level business, yeah. because for, for most of the big companies, of course, you have to take in, into account the time and the loyalty of the employee. Yeah. So, so they spend, well, not enough, but as much time in the within the organization that after a while, they had to be promoted anyway, upwards. But a big enterprise level organization usually supports that promotion or hopefully supports that promotion with some internal training programs, teaching yeah. those soft skills, teaching those uh, capabilities on how to get promoted and become a leader. And yeah, yeah take the job it, for it, medium sized companies, it's, it's different. Yeah, yeah. And well, and on the flip side of what we were just talking about, it's important for organizations, for leaders and executives to recognize that because the skill set we're discussing is different than those, the technical expertise, perhaps of the people that they're going to be leading, you should be looking for a different type of potential leader in that formal role. You don't yeah. need the, you don't need the best salesperson to now be the manager, right? You need a good leader to, to be in that role where they have a team of people. And so it, it's shifting part of it's just shifting the mindset that we look, we think in different ways. We look in different ways for the people who are actually going to be a really good fit for that, that particular role with that particular team and the overall culture and the dynamic of the organization. And that, that kind of approach flies in the face of a lot of tradition and a lot of ways that companies have run, you know, for a really long time. And that's part of the problem. We just end up perpetuating the same dysfunctions over time. Yeah. And how do you, how do you learn those? Let's talk about the learning curve. You can't skip that. How do you learn the soft skills? Let's give an example then. I'm highly introvert. I don't really know how to influence others and other people, but I do know my trade. I'm an expert in my skills. I have capabilities and I also spent enough time in various organizations and senior roles. So I do know how to work within a team, how to work with other people but I'm not a great influencer, shall we say. So how can I learn that? Yeah, I think the first step in, in learning is sometimes we need to shift our mindset. So Carol Dweck talks a lot about fixed versus growth mindset. I'm a big believer in growth mindset. That's the idea that we, we actually can learn and grow and develop continually throughout our life. That yes, we were born with certain capabilities, certain talents, we're, we're born into a particular situation that influences our opportunity. You know, our privilege dictates, you know, the type of education we get. So there's lots of these external factors that we don't have any control over that influences what we end up doing with our life. But we, there's a lot of stuff that we do have control over. And so when we focus on our sphere of stewardship, our sphere of influence, what we actually can control and what we actually can uh, manage, and then focus on that, then we can start to set goals towards developing new skills, new capabilities, and growing into those new types of roles over time. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But the first step is shifting that mindset. So if we are inclined to think of ourselves as stuck, if we're inclined to think of ourselves as, no, I'm a technical person, I'm, I'm a coder, I'm not a leader. If that's the way we view ourselves, chances are we're not going to be a good leader. The first thing we have to do is realize that hey, I can develop these skills. If maybe I want, maybe I, I recognize I don't have the skills right now, but I can develop them. I want to develop them. I'm going to set goals. I'm going to put myself in places where I can interact with people and learn from them. I'm going to have stretch opportunities where I can, you know, learn little by little and gain confidence. Do, tr you know, formal training programs are great, but there's no substitute for on-the-job training and experiential learning. And so, you know, finding yourselves an opportunity and exactly. And so finding yourselves in those opportunities, putting yourselves into those circumstances where you can have, you know, start to learn those skill sets, you know, that's, that's really vital. Now, clearly organizations also need to do their part. So if I'm an executive or an organizational leader, say an HR manager or the CHRO in an organization, mm -hmm. you know, I have responsibility for the learning and development of the people throughout the organization. So hopefully I have set up career pathways, career lanes, and 
I, I target individuals that are high potential individuals and I involve them in training and development programs, mentoring programs, coaching opportunities, those sorts of, of initiatives so that you can have a continual pipeline of really great people learning and developing as they go throughout their career. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. We, we also need to recognize that life stage matters. And so some people, yeah. you know, say in their 20s, you know, out of college, they're a coder and they're just really great at it. They love it. They like the money. They like the lifestyle. But maybe, you know, now they're in their 30s or their 40s and they're settled down a little bit. Maybe they have a family. Maybe their 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 needs, their goals, their desires have shifted just due to their their changing trajectory in life. That's natural. That happens for a lot of people, perhaps yeah. most people. And so we, as organizational leaders, need to understand that. And just because someone five years ago said they weren't interested in a leadership role, that doesn't mean they won't be interested in today, right? Their circumstances could be completely different. But one thing I've seen over and over again <clears throat> is actually people end up getting pigeonholed in an organization. If they've been there for a long time, they, they end up getting pigeonholed and, and there's this kind of general perspective around that individual throughout the leadership in the organization. And then people just make assumptions and they just say, you know, well, no, no, they're not interested. They're really great at what they do. They have no interest in this. Again, that may have been true five, 10 years ago. That may have no validity today. Go ahead. But, but, but yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. But, uh, but, but, but as you said, most of the time, the, the, the situation can change. Most of the startup founders, I mean, everyone, everyone thinks that the, that the usual startup founder is some 20 something year old kid in San Francisco running with a bunch of VC money. but. But the, the truth is f farther than that. So most of the people who are founding startup companies or new companies are late 30s, early 40s, spend some time in a job in a senior or, well, not managerial role. So a problem. And now, you know, there's a situation where they can shift and, and do something with their own entrepreneurial spirit, but they still do not have the, the skills to become a really great leader. They have the the master expert skills of certain types of jobs, of course, because they spent like a decade in there, but they don't have the, the leadership skills. And that's why they need to learn at the age of, you know, 30, 38 or more. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, so once you have people, <clears throat> I guess my point is don't force it on people who have no interest or desire to take on leadership roles, right? Depending on where someone's at in their life and their career, that can ebb and flow. Right. But assuming you have someone who now they, they have the desire, they have the ambition, they have the trajectory in their career, they have these goals in their life and for their career, they want to be better leaders. Once you've established that and you've established the mindset that they can develop and grow into these roles, I think the next, well, part of that mindset, but really the next phase is to foster the humility necessary for them to continue that learning because they've been so successful up to that point in their career, th there, there can be a tendency to have a level of arrogance about them. Right. And that's true for all of us, right? You have, you, you, you have successes, you feel more confident 
the challenge is, can, can you be both confident and humble at the same time, recognizing that there's still more to learn, there's still more that you don't know. And so I, 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 I kind of joke about this, but some of the stupidest people I know are some of the most intelligent people I know. And the reason I say that is I, I, I feel like they're stupid because they're, they're stunting their own continual growth because of their mindset, because of their hubris and their arrogance, they think they have it all figured out. They think that they know everything. And, and so then they stop pushing themselves. They stop trying to learn new things. They stop looking at the environment and trying to figure out where the gaps are. Those are the types of people, I don't care how intelligent they are. They may have a crazy IQ. And I know some people like this, like some of the people in my life that are the most brilliant people are also the most arrogant and kind of stupid. They really miss the big picture a lot of times, right? And so that's that's the next challenge is you have to make sure that these very successful people who are now in these roles and there's, you know, that that has an ego factor for them because now, you know, you're in this important role and people look up to you and stuff. That's great. Confidence is good, but you have to foster, you know, a certain level of intellectual humility in order to continue to, uh, continually, you know, grow and progress throughout your life and throughout your career. And that's what the greatest leaders do. The greatest leaders have a growth mindset. They recognize the importance of lifelong learning. They don't ever allow themselves to become stagnant. And they're always pushing themselves. They're always pushing their thinking. They're always challenging their assumptions. And they're always trying to surround themselves with brilliant people. They're not intimidated by having smart people around them. Leaders who are insecure want to want to be the top person right and then they try to have they try to surround themselves with sycophants and yes men and yes women you know who who will think that they're brilliant and do everything they say that's not a good leader the great leaders are those who recognize that they don't have all the expertise in all the specific technical areas that's why you create a great team and you get all the people around you and then together you create something awesome that, that's a different mindset, right? Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I, and I see that so often that you just described. By the way, if you, if you do have this, shall we say, arrogant mindset that you, that you think that you figured everything out, you are prone to, to respond worse to change. It's really hard to change your way of thinking, really hard to change the course of your company because you think that you figured it out, but well, you didn't. So let's, let's address a little bit of change because well, we are living in a really disturbed time and businesses need to adapt and need to change to certain levels of environmental change anyway. And you also teach change management for companies as well. So what do you think how a company can successfully adapt to a new, totally new or changed environment in business? What are the necessary steps that they need to take? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Again, I think it starts with the mindset and the assumptions that people have uh, around learning and growth. And if, if we have a growth mindset, that not only applies to individuals, but that applies to organizations. So we want a growth culture within our organization. We want a learning uh, organization, a, a learning environment where we're continually trying things, we're iterating, we're innovating, right? That's the kind of organization that has the potential to be successful in today's ever, you know, quickly changing hyper-competitive marketplace, right? We have competitors, we're, we're so globally interconnected. We have competitors, not just in our own little geographic region, we have competitors everywhere. And the rapid pace of, of change is constant. So if we wanna be able to function in that kind of an environment, then we, I mean, th there are processes that you can go through for specific change initiatives. And we can talk about that. But generally speaking, we just need to have a, a change culture within our organization so that, so that we're not continually running into resistance to change. Because the human tendency, <clears throat> if we don't <clears throat> um, proactively create an alternative paradigm and culture, the human tendency is to resist change because we like certainty, we like comfort and stability, we, and so organizations, the traditional organization is set up to perpetuate, sustain, and move forward the status quo. That's why bureaucracies were invented. <laughs> yes. You know, so in, institutional structures exist to 
continue the existence of the institution. So if you, if you want to change, then you have to break down the resistance and you have to create this culture where everyone just knows and expects like, yeah, we're, 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 we're learning, we're growing. Things are going to constantly be changing. That doesn't mean it has to be a threat. And in fact, it's the opposite. If, if we create that kind of a, of a learning environment, we are better positioned to continually respond to the ever-shifting marketplace to continue to drive value, which means the organization is going to be more successful, more sustainable, and our jobs are more secure. The most insecure we will be is if we're, if we're stuck in an old way of doing things and everything changes around us, we're slow to adapt or to pivot. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're filing for bankruptcy and everyone loses their job. So, yeah. I mean, I, I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but that's, that's the kind of environment we need to create. Once we can start to create that kind of an environment, then we can start to go through, you know, specific processes, you know, in, in dealing with specific change initiatives. So say tech integration, you know, maybe we have some new technology we're trying to use throughout the business or digital transformation, you know, and utilizing that technology better across all areas of the organization. Maybe you have a new hierarchical structure. Maybe there's a merger or an acquisition. Maybe you're just, you're trying to bring on a new executive or a new division in, in, that you're spinning up to address a new need. And, and so there's shifts related to that. There's all these different specific types of change initiatives that an organization might decide they need to undertake. And then, you know, we can, there are processes to try to go about doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think vision, this is, this is where the vision comes comes into the play, into into the picture because what I see also even so more regularly now that that a, a company because of a huge change and and constant change within the business environment they are also embracing change usually so they are changing within and with the environment but that also has some wild side effects right so without the vision of the leadership usually what happens with this constant changing is that the team around the leader gets tired of the constant switches of focus, the constant switches of change that's implemented. And, and, and we call that change fatigue, right? Yeah, it's change. Yeah. Yeah. So change fatigue is a big problem. And I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, that's part, fine. Of, part, part of the, the issue that we need to face is, again, creating a culture of continual growth, continual development, continual iterations in our processes, our policies, practices, procedures, you know, the uh, products and services that we create, all of that, you know, we're, we're continually iterating. If we can create that environment, that's, that's wonderful. The change fatigue that I see really hitting organizations the most, it happens when you have continual change that doesn't make sense. <laughs> so, you, you know, maybe it's a leader, you know, it's, it's like the, the latest flavor of the month, the, the new fad. So, yeah. you know, what, whatever you're chasing the fad, instead of chasing the strategic, you know, direction of what the organization needs to do to be successful. When you connect the change with a clear why back to the vision and the mission of the organization and how it's going yeah. to help the people do their jobs better and be more successful. Yeah, there's still going to be some resistance, but it's going to be way easier. But when you just have continual fad chasing and you're going after the next thing, People get so tired of that so quickly and, and they don't see the benefit of it. And so then they, that's where the resistance really gets built up and that change fatigue really takes hold. And, and that is toxic. So that's certainly not what we want. Yeah. And also see that it's in come up with, uh, with certain age gaps, by the way, the change fatigue and the constant changing, usually it's around above 50 when they are they don't really know how to respond to changes around the environment because of the lack of leadership skills and vision, but, but they're still embracing the change. And also I see that it's very same with very young people when they are also in, the, in this instant gratification thing and, oh, here is the new trend, so I should jump on at that. And that leaves uh, most of these organizations in a constant changing environment. And uh, that's really tiring for, for, for the team members usually. Yeah. What do you think the, the psychological effects of the business environment and talking about, for example, the COVID situation that we do have right now, I think it really creates personal and also business anxiety as well. As a leader, personally, I do think that it's totally fine to show that anxiety to your team members, honestly, mm -hmm. and, and make it a little bit more 
transparent yes i'm also a human did you know that so that's that that's really important but but i'm not sure how or what would you advise how to deal with that anxiety that stress level that is not from within your organization because of you're doing something wrong but it's some something like external yeah. coming from your environment yeah it's a it's a great point and and right now we can talk about the pandemic but it's you know there's all sorts of disruptive things it happening can be all around us. Yeah, yeah. it can be anything and i think one thing that we've learned I, we knew about this before the pandemic but i think it's it's we we've really zoomed in on it and really more and more people recognize it today than maybe a year ago <clears throat> is the importance of empathy in the business place vulnerability and authenticity you mentioned transparency so I, I think those those all go together. So the traditional model of like a, a strong, powerful, confident leader isn't really compatible with this idea of a vulnerable leader who admits to difficulties and challenges, who admits to stress and anxiety and whatnot. But when we when we can do that with our people, what it, it well, it does a couple of things. One is it's just, we're more genuine and authentic, which means people can trust us more. It, it's people aren't stupid. They know stuff's going on. And so we just need, we just need to be open with them. But when we're vulnerable and when we're, when we're showing genuine compassion and empathy, it gives our people permission to do the same, right? Everyone's yes. dealing with these difficult challenges. We're not fooling anyone. If we just have this workplace environment where everyone shows up, they check all of their personal stuff at the door, you know, once, you know, sometimes they, people say we want a professional culture. And what they mean by that is, you know, leave your own personal stuff at home, check your emotions, be stoic, come into the workplace and just do your job. You know, that, that's, that model is not sustainable. That's we, we not sustainable. Robots, right? sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's not for humans. Yeah, exactly. We're human beings. And so we as leaders set the tone, we need to be able to show that vulnerability ourselves. We then give permission to our people to do the same. And then we develop meaningful, genuine relationships with our team. And we can lean on and rely on each other because everyone has good days and bad days. Everyone, you know, everyone's mood ebbs and flows. And everyone has, you know, real big difficulties that they have to face in life from time to time, you know, yeah. hopefully no tragedies befall anyone on our team, but it happens like things happen. And so we need to, to remember that we're all human beings. And, you know, even if we set the human argument aside and we just talk about the business case of transparency, open communication, authenticity and such, the research is pretty darn clear that even, you know, setting, you know, what we may call the warm, fuzzy human stuff, set that aside and just say, what's going to help the organization be more effective and efficient and in innovative. It's the research is clear. It, it's as we do these things to lead our people in genuine ways and develop trust in, in relationships that helps us attract and retain the best people. It creates a more dynamic learning environment where, where innovation can happen and where our people can thrive that helps the bottom line of the organization. It, it's pretty darn crystal clear. So that's what we need to be doing. That's what leaders need to be doing. And again, coming all the way back to where we started, frankly, that's not what most leaders have been trained to do. That's not the skill set that they have. That's not what they've seen other people do in their past. And so we need to proactively try to counter, you know, any of those dysfunctional styles or approaches and be more proactive about making sure that we're leading a healthy organization. I love that. That was a really happy and, and humble closure for this talk. I love it. Thank you for sharing. If anyone wants to engage with you or have any questions or they want to develop their leadership skills, can you share some contact details, please? Yeah, you can definitely reach out to me or anyone on my team by going to innovativehumancapital.com. That's the firm's website. We also, so we have tons of awesome resources there, lots of free resources, webinars, research briefs, snapshots and such. Our goal is to try to add value and to help provide practical tips that can allow leaders to start improving and making an impact today. So go check out our website, check out the research section uh, and subsections. We have tons of really great content there. 
we uh, have a podcast, I referred to that earlier, the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. We're approaching our 500th episode. About, about 300 of those episodes have been interviews with thought leaders and executives, people from around the world. So that's a great resource. I would definitely encourage you to check that out. I also have a book that came out in the fall, in November, called The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership. That's available on Amazon and you know in any major book outlet. Take a look at that. It gets into a lot of the things we were talking about today, frankly, and spells it out. And I tried to make it really practical. And so there's at the end of each chapter, there's guiding self-reflection questions and there's opportunity for goal setting. And the whole idea being, we want to grow, we want to learn, we want to continue to develop ourselves. So please do reach out to me, check out the website and let me know if you have any questions or if there's anything I can do to help you. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I love this approach that you're providing so much, so much, so much value for free for people. I think it's very humble and really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And, and I look forward to interacting with you again. Likewise. Thank you. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.